get behind me, Satan. It's a good line, isn't it? Get behind me, Satan. When I've used it or heard it used, it's almost always been in jest, used to playfully rebuke a temptation of some kind of other or other. It's such a great phrase. But if we look again at the biblical context, we can see something deeper going on here. <coughs> excuse, excuse me. This is a serious matter, all joking aside. I can just imagine the conversations that ensue when Peter pulls Jesus aside. It's probably like the conversations that many of us have had to have after we speak a difficult truth, after we point out something that others don't want to see, after we refuse to gloss over pain or struggle, after we name what's really going on in a difficult situation. It seems to me, however, that most of the time, many of us struggle to look directly and unflinchingly into reality especially when it isn't pretty. Most of us are epic deniers and avoiders. We like to encourage and see the best in situations. So hearing Jesus say that things aren't going to end well just isn't what Peter wants to hear. It's not going to keep the morale of the disciples up and it's certainly not going to help them recruit new followers. No one wants to join up with someone who's predicting their own failure, their own demise. So come on, Jesus, chin up. It's going to be okay. I'm guessing that's something about how Peter's rebuke sounded. The power of positive thinking. But Jesus knows where they're heading. If not in full, at least in part. He knows that his enormous popularity with the masses is going to make him un unpopular with the authorities. <coughs> Jesus simply refuses to lead people on. He refuses to pretend he's on anything other than a collision course with the powers and principalities. And not just the corrupt powers occupying Palestine, but also the powers of the cosmic evil, the forces of rebellion against all that is good and holy. For Jesus, it was infinitely important to tell the truth. So he refused the tinnery of positive thinking, refused to offer false hope. I'm guessing the disciples had started off with very high hopes that they were following the next big name in Judean spirituality. It must have been so very thrilling to show up into a new town or village and be overrun by fans, to be following a man who could heal the sick, cast out demons. How could it end in the way that Jesus was suggesting? They were doing so much good, helping so many people, offering hope to the hopeless. It couldn't. It wouldn't. It's too much to imagine it all ending. It felt impossible, unthinkable. So Peter told Jesus to stop, to stop that negative thinking. Get on with it. Get behind me, Satan. Get behind, says Jesus. Have you not yet understood? There is no winning on this journey, no building up of the self. There is little prestige, few accolades. This, this is the path of downward mobility. And we still don't quite want to hear it. We still want to rebuke Jesus ourselves, tell him that his version of things is wrong. We want a sunnier kind of Christianity. But just like the disciples, we're setting our mind not on divine things, but on human things. We're evaluating things using the wrong framework. We still don't want to believe that those who don't believe who don't have faith in Jesus, don't have salvation. We don't want to believe it because that may include our loved ones. It may include us. We want a more tolerant faith. It's okay, there's salvation for everyone. You don't have to do anything, you don't have to believe. But then here comes Jesus bursting our bubble. Tiresome, isn't it? Irritating. Not really very polite, but he keeps on doing it because we haven't yet really heard. God has cast down the mighty from their thrones and has lifted up the lowly. God has filled the hungry with good things. The rich has, he has sent empty away. Painful. So painful because he's talking to us, about us. 
Yes, there are certainly mightier and richer folk than us. And we all want to be mighty and rich, don't we? I do. A lot of time, I fall into that trap of wanting things. More money would be nice. I watch the TV and I see the adverts. I see what I'm supposed to have, what I'm supposed to strive for. I could be easily taken in. I want to be comfortable. I want everything I need at my beck and call. I want only the highest quality, the best of the best. I want to be rich. But you see, it's not just about power or money. It's also all about control and comfort. And ultimately, it's about trying to save our lives. These are the things we do to try and save our lives. These are all the, the ways we try to outrun annihilation. These things are buffers we build to protect ourselves from suffering, to keep us from caring too much about the dying in foreign wars, those coping with addictions, those homeless on our streets, those who don't yet know Christ. And ultimately, these are all the ways that we separate ourselves from God, separate and protected, protected from the impingement of others. And yet, it is precisely in losing our lives by opening them up to others in need that we can be saved. It is finally releasing our fear, our tightly wound efforts at control, that we can finally walk into freedom. Are you afraid of filth? Go and be with the dirtiest people you can find. Are you afraid of illness? Go and be with the sickest people you can find. Are you afraid of losing your security? Be with those who have no homes, who experience addictions. Jesus has the perfect prescription for each of us. Jesus can help us lose our lives. And in the process, he can and will save us. On a Thursday evening service here, we often mark an anniversary of someone who has been influential in bringing people to faith, to salvation, or who have stood up in the faith, even to death. So I thought I'd tell you a couple of stories this morning. The first, Archbishop Romeo. Romero. He was one of the most remarkable figures in the 20th century, who sacrificed his life standing up to injustice. Oscar Romero was the Archbishop of San Salvador from 1977 until he was assassinated in 1980. He became increasingly outspoken about human rights violations in El Salvador. During his three years as Archbishop, Romero repeatedly denounced violence and spoke out on behalf of the victims of civil war. In a time of heavy press censorship, his weekly radio broadcasts were often the only way people could find out the truth about the atrocities that were happening in their country. He defended the right of the poor to demand political change, a stance which made him troublesome, a troublesome adversary for the country's rulers. Romero wrote to President Jimmy Carter, urging the US to stop backing the Salvadorian government and supplying it with arms and military advisers. Not much change from the US. He urged soldiers and police to follow, not to follow orders to kill civilians and to stop the repression. The peasants you kill are your own brothers and sisters, he preached. When you hear a man telling you to kill, remember God's words, thou shalt not kill. In the name of God and in the name of this suffering people whose laments rise to, heavenly, to the heavens each day, I beg you, I beseech you, I order you, in the name of God, stop the repression. Archbishop Romero was shot dead on the 24th of March 1980, aged 62, while celebrating Mass. In the ensuing decade, some 70,000 Salvadorans were killed in that civil war. Another story, Elias Shakur. Elias was born in the Palestinian village of Biram in the Galilee, near Nazareth, in 1938. In 1947, 
Zionists occupied much of Palestine and destroyed Palestinian homes, killing and taking possessions. Elias's father and elder brother were kidnapped, taken away. Thousands were killed. The family was later and eventually reunited, but they were then refugees with no possessions, possessions and they were never able to return home. Despite this, his parents remained strong in faith and taught their children, blessed are the peacemakers and love your neighbour even when bad is done to you. Elias was able to resume school and eventually he entered the Greek Melkite Seminary and was ordained priest in 1965. He was then sent to the small Galilean village of Iblin. He was asked to rebuild the broken down church. He began to quietly physically rebuild and invited other local Christians and Muslims to join him. But then he realised that God was asking him to do more than that. And with the hope of the local community, he built a school, just a small square hut with just one room. But he invited Christian, Muslim and Jewish children to attend. The Israeli government authorities were not happy with this and they demolished the school. But it was rebuilt and demolished several times. Elias had to fight hard to get funding from abroad and against the Israeli authorities who tried to stop him at every turn. Until today, the school in Iblin has 3,000 students, from infants to seniors, from all three faith backgrounds. It is the only school of its kind in Israel, and by studying and working together, come, students come to value each other, their differences, and this is all in a land which is otherwise completely divided. Sometimes we have to go against the prevailing thought, the prevailing country, and say, get behind me, Satan, so that we can clearly hear God's calling. It will never be an easy ride, as God's way is countercultural. But he does promise to be beside each one of us, each step of the way. There is no winning on this journey. There is no building up of self. There is little prestige and few accolades. This, this is the path of downward mobility. But ultimately, we have salvation. I wonder, have we the courage to step out and follow Christ? Amen.